It's helped us inspire people that don't think of themselves as developers to consider doing projects like this and really invest in their community. Business of Architecture, episode 320. Hello and welcome back, Architect Nation. I'm Enoch Sears, and this is the show where you'll learn tips, strategies, and secrets for running a profitable and impactful architecture practice. Let me ask you a question. Have you ever been frustrated that you saw potential in a project, but were constrained by your client? Have you ever wished that you could initiate your own project, do away with the clients, and be your own client? Well, today's guest has done just that. Joining us is architect Katie Chintis, co-founder of WC Studio, based out of Tacoma, Washington. Just out of school, Katie and her partner, John Walters, bought a building in Chicago that they rehabbed and were able to sell at a profit. They used the proceeds from that sale to start up a practice in Tacoma, and they launched more development projects. In this episode, you'll hear how Katie and her partner pulled this off. Katie also talks about the missing middle multifamily project type and the potential these kind of projects have to fill a gap in our urban stock. Here's today's interview with architect Katie Chintis. Hello, Katie, and welcome to the Business of Architecture show. So so glad to have you here. Thanks. Hi, Enoch. Good to be here. So tell us about this concept of self-initiated projects development. How did you get started with your first project, not just as a designer, but actually getting involved in the development of a project? Yeah, our, I guess our adventure started in Chicago. Uh, Around 2009, we started looking for a multiple unit building to purchase that we could live in and then uh, likely rehab as we uh, as we went along one unit at a time. And we were really interested in the idea. Of course, in Chicago, that's almost all there is, is uh, small multifamily buildings that, you know, most people live in a three flat or six flat. And so we were looking for something in that range. We had heard of the uh, 203K loan type uh, where you could purchase a property and then up to four units and then uh, you could still finance that through sort of a conventional mortgage, but with a rehab component to you. To it, so uh, the bank would actually lend you more money than you purchased, so that you could use that towards uh, towards the redevelopment and the rehab. And in the end, we didn't end up uh, going that route with that type of loan. But we why is that, Katie? Can you explain that for me? Sure. Uh, I think it was a combination of we found a building that was in a little better shape than some of the others we had been considering. We walked through a lot of what I called mold monsters, uh, just really uh, poor conditions uh, inside these buildings, uh, you know, would have definitely had to be taken down to the studs, you know, to really start fresh. And, um, the building that we ended up finding was a little bit further uh, to the northern end of the city, uh, a little bit further out than we maybe initially thought where we would end up, but it was in a lot better condition. And the improvements that we needed to make were somewhat more on the cosmetic side, uh, just just updating new kitchens, new bathrooms, and uh, you know things for comfort like more better insulation and uh, better uh, air systems and things. Well, that doesn't sound like just cosmetic. I'm hearing <laughs> dollar signs here. Kitchens, bathrooms, air systems, uh, insulation. What were the, what did the numbers look like on that project, if you don't mind sharing? Kind of how much did you buy it for? What did you put down? Yeah, well, I have to think back a little bit. But we, I want to say that the purchase price was around 250000 so for three units, that seemed like a really good opportunity. Uh, I think our agent really encouraged us to to jump at that, even though it was a little bit outside the zone we were originally looking in. And, uh, you know, we didn't, like I said, we didn't end up going through the 203K loan process. And so it probably is harder to track the expenses for that project than we're used to now uh, that we've become a little more 
serious about it, about development. But, um, you know, we just, we probably put uh, between 10 and 20,000 into each unit. And we did that slowly, one at a time. And we actually lived in two of them during those renovations. And so we were able to uh, still have a little bit of income from the units that were rented out while we were doing those renovations. And I'm sorry, how many units were in this project? Three units. There was a, a garden apartment, the sort of halfway uh, below grade, and then a main level, you know, with a porch and a few steps up, and then a, a top level. And so you lived in two of them while you refurbished the third one? Uh, we, we lived, actually, <laughs> we lived in the, when we uh, took ownership of the building, the two upper apartments were rented and we, we had those people uh, continue their leases and we moved into the lowest unit. We started, really started at the bottom, <laughs> literally. Um, and we, uh, that was the unit that was probably in the worst shape. So we had, um, we were living in a real mess uh, for a while as we uh, worked through that renovation. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, sleep, sleeping on a mattress on the floor with curtain, plastic curtains to keep the drywall dust out of spaces. It, yeah, all that. <laughs> yeah, this is the good story that we want to hear. We want to hear what did it really take to do this? Yeah, yeah. I'm not going to hold back. I'm not going to sugarcoat it at all. <laughs> um, so during this time, were you working? Were you going to school? What was What were you doing when you weren't trying to avoid drywall dust? Yeah, um, so we were working and uh, John was working full time. John's the uh, John's the W and WC and I'm the C. And uh, so John was working at Studio Gang Architects and I was working uh, more as a free freelance, just helping out um, sole practitioners um, kind of in the midst of this two, 2009 recession that we had. So, um, so I think we had a little more maybe more time on our hands at that point uh and uh but we had finished school got it so you had a little bit of time there's some income coming in um the money for the down payment for the unit is that money that you just saved up over time did you guys rob a thrift store or the corner <laughs> market yeah we had just enough work history i think uh before you know, everything kind of came crashing down in 2008, 2009, uh, where we were able to save a little, you know, uh, at least a, I can't remember now, a 10% down payment. Uh, and we also borrowed some small amounts from family as well, just to, as a cushion, which was helpful. Got it. And with the family, I mean, that's great that you were able to reach out to them and you had that network. Did you promise them interest? Just what was the deal there, if you don't mind me asking? Yeah, I don't mind. Uh, w in this, uh, with this loan, we didn't promise them any interest. We, and they were really talking about like five or $10,000 uh, in, in this situation. Uh, and so uh, it was more of a, an interest-free loan uh, that we, that our parents were nice enough to, uh, help us out with just to have a bit more, bit of a cushion. Amazing. Uh, so you're yeah. you're staying in the you're staying in the the basement, the garden, the garden flat, basically fixing that up. You fix that up. What's the next step with this particular project? Yeah, the next step was um, moving up to the first level, the main level. Uh, we were able to find some people to rent the garden unit and so did you have to uh, evict the person that was on the first level or no uh th their lease was up and uh they had recently uh had another baby and they were they were just ki it kind of worked out that uh, we didn't have to ask them to leave they were ready perfect yeah and when you say that the upgrades that you did are we talking are we talking new cabinets help me understand bathroom new tile how did you yeah. do the insulation? That sounds like quite a, a chore. Yeah, so uh, we uh, we really did, it was pretty minimal as far as insulation or anything heavy duty, but we did um, 
we, you know, we scraped off layers of wallpaper, under paint, under wallpaper. <laughs> uh, we uh, did full renovations of the kitchen, everything new, ca cabinets, countertops, appliances. Although I, if I remember right, we did buy some used appliances uh, for that project. And uh, we just got them looking a lot better, a lot fresher, um, more comfor comfortable. Um, in the bathrooms, same thing. Um, you know, these Chicago, old Chicago three flats, they have great uh, clawfoot tubs. And we were able to, in some cases, uh, spruce those up, reglaze them, um, paint the outside black or something like that. New tile, new fixtures and faucets and lights and all that kind of stuff. Good. So you got it looking really good. And what happened next? Uh, well, uh, in in this project, we uh, we'd ne we'd, we learned our lesson, I guess you could say, uh, with the first two uh, units. And then we, when the upper floor tenants were ready to move out, uh, we stayed in the in the main floor while we renovated the second floor. So finally, we weren't actually living in the construction zone. I bet yeah. that was a nice relief after doing that. It, it, for It was. <laughs> what time period are we talking? Are we, did this take 18 months? Was it about a year? How long? It probably was close to 18 months uh, okay. to do the three renovations. Yeah. Okay. Great. So then you were able to fix up the last flat and did you guys sell the building? Did you, do you still have it? We did sell the building um, probably like three or so years after we had pur initially purchased it. And uh, at this point, uh, we, John was getting a little bit antsy to get back to the Northwest. Uh, he's from this area originally. And uh, so we were some, we were thinking of making a move uh, somewhere out West and we visited some cities, you know, from San Francisco, Portland, Seattle, and uh, John had attended university at the University of Washington before I had some, had spent some time in Seattle, had some contacts here already. So um, it, it was where we ended up choosing, uh, choosing to move. So excellent. So when you sold that, I, I would imagine there was a, a nice bit of upside for that property that you bought in Chicago. It sounds like you got an excellent deal on it. You know, the whole idea that you make money when you buy, not when you sell. And did you walk away with that with a big chunk of cash? Did you do 1031 exchange? What, how did that go? Yeah, we, we did uh, make some money on that project. It's you know, it's always hard to quantify how much you actually made if you would have uh, tracked the time that you, the, you know, your sweat equity that you put in and, ha you know, what was your hourly wage during that that period. But <laughs> I imagine it wasn't really that much, but it, it did give us a nest egg to, uh, to move uh, to a new location, uh, Pacific Northwest, and to essentially launch our independent business. Um, wow. So you, you moved to completely blank to a new area, completely started up a new practice. What were the challenges behind that? How did you find that process for you? Uh, I think the, the challenges were definitely... Um, well, I'll start with I'll start with something positive. Uh, we had maintained good relationships with some of uh, John's contacts, an architect and mentor that he had started as a undergraduate, uh, working with filing papers, you know, uh, drafting that kind of thing. And so uh, we had stayed in touch, and uh, there ended up being some opportunities to collaborate on projects. Uh, with with this architect, so it did give us uh, a way to transition. So we weren't just you know ha going having to go out and find clients from day one on our own. So the challenge, I think, was just being in a new location. We were uh, co-locating our office and our home, which we 
still do to this day, but when you're first in a new city, it can be a little isolating. And on top, I think on top of that, just all of the uh, administration things that go into running a business that uh, architects probably don't really think about just everything from filing your operating agreement to your quarterly taxes and licenses, those kinds of things that you have to stay on top of. I think those were, those are the main challenges. Yeah. All that business side of it, let's face it. There's so many, you know, practicing in terms of working for someone else is much different than actually doing, having your own practice. So you had, that's great. You had a bit of a runway with the collaboration with this previous architect. So I imagine that took off a lot of the stress and the, the anxiety about, Hey, where's the next project going to come from? Mm -hmm. How did you start to get more projects beyond that? What was your, your marketing referrals? How did that process work for you guys? Yeah, I think most of our early work was through referrals from um, this other architect, David Foster. And uh, also we, uh, we fell in with, uh, we're, we're really into cycling. So that was really our way into a network of people that, you know, were adding on to their homes or uh, moving a new business in somewhere. So we actually, a lot of our clients have come through our cycling friends and relationships as well. Fantastic. And so you, you started getting some of these projects from the network that you created through the cycling organization, your cycling groups you're part of. And how long did it take you to, to go into your next project? And then if you would also describe this concept of the missing middle. I know that's how I found you as I stumbled across an article you'd written about that. Yeah, so I think immediately our idea in Seattle was to uh, was to do a, a next development project, self-initiated project. Um, and so we spent the first year living in Seattle and, uh, you know, learning again the real estate market there. And we probably after about a year of getting different properties under contract and doing our feasibility and due diligence periods on those and just always coming to the same conclusion that if it was on the market for what seemed like a reasonable price tag to us, there was a fatal flaw. Uh, you know, there needed to be hundreds of feet of utilities installed or uh, things that just really uh, wouldn't make the project feasible for us. And mm -hmm. Uh, we came to the conclusion that the conclusion that uh, we were a little behind the curve as far as Seattle's growth uh, growth curve. We just a, a few years too late. Uh, so another thing about Seattle, uh, the Seattle area compared to Chicago, is that it's kind of the neighborhoods are really the reverse uh, of older cities where. Um, like I was saying in Chicago, there almost everybody lives in a three flat or a six flat, some type of multiplex, uh, multi, small multifamily building. And out here, there seems to only be, you have the single family homes and then you have the large apartment buildings and not a lot of options in between. Um, mm. Sometimes you can find that gem, that vintage building from the 40s or before modern zoning codes went into effect, but they're pretty rare and they're never new. <laughs> and that's interesting because we could almost see that as a product of those modern zoning codes. It's either single family or it's multifamily. If it's multifamily, we get as much density as we can on there. And if it's single family, well, it's just one home. And so, yeah, yeah. And the multifamily is, uh, really uh, funneled into these narrow corridors, it seems like, and, you know, building up the density there, but uh, kind of homogenous in, in these five over two large whole block, whole city block buildings. So just personally, uh, we were looking for that, uh, you know, for ourselves to live in and experience a neighborhood that has the the walkability and the community that we felt in Chicago. And so we 
understood that we were going to have to build that most likely uh, to to find something like that to settle into. It's the so. definition of city building, right? Well, we can't find the place we want to live. Let's just let's just build it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so is that the primary motivation, Katie, for for getting into these these developing your own projects was actually to create something that you where you wanted to live, or what what other factors were at play here? Oh, there's definitely other factors. Uh, getting to live in one of our projects is kind of a bonus, uh, but really we wanted to develop another revenue stream that might be uh, out of sync or or level off the. Uh, instability that we had experienced during the last recession. So um, for us, it's it's a retirement plan to have buildings that we own and rent out. And um, it's a way that we're working towards, hopefully one day that will give us enough income that we can be more selective about the projects that we do take. Uh, and I guess in that vein too, it gave us projects, built work that we, that they go in our portfolio that now client, we're hoping clients now come to us because they've seen that work and uh, they, so it's just a way to start our practice that way too. So you discovered that these, you were trying to find something that was already built and they're just, it just wasn't penciling out. And so you approached a new idea. Tell me, how did you do the first project? How did that come about? Yeah, I think, well, in Seattle, we were looking for land uh, to build new on. Uh, we, you, we, up until this point at least, have always looked for sites that are empty, um, not sites that we'd have to demolish a building. Uh, but yeah, we we sort of gave up on Seattle at some point and we became interested in Tacoma, which is about 30 miles south of Seattle. And a lot of people say about Tacoma, it's like how Seattle or Portland was 20 years ago. And there's a lot more, uh, there's a lot more land available here in Tacoma and uh, the rents aren't as high as in Seattle, but the buy-in to start a new project is is lower and more approachable for a uh, neighborhood developer. People with day jobs, we like to say. And that would be you guys. Yeah. Um, yeah, we, you know, we say we're architects first, but uh, we do really enjoy uh, self-initiating projects and acting as our own client. We, it's like practicing on ourselves. So we have a little bit of freedom to test ideas and uh, prove those ideas so that when we do have a client that might be reticent about something, we can show them how it works. And it also gives us experience in the finances of a project teaching ourselves about pro formas. We understand that that's a real thing in projects. And I think it has made it easier to work with clients uh, going forward and have them trust us. Define for our listeners who may not be aware, what is, what is a pro forma? Yeah, pro forma is basically like a spreadsheet um, where you track all of the costs in a project, and that includes everything in the construction uh, bucket, you know, the sticks and the bricks, some people like to say, uh, labor, everything that goes into really building the project, and then uh, everything else as well, such as the land costs, the permit costs, any consultants beyond the architect since we were able to uh, do that part ourselves. And uh, there's, and then it even looks forward uh, to, you know, however many years out you'd like to go with it as far as what the anticipated rents are going to be, what your payment is going to be when that construction loan converts to a mortgage and any ongoing operating expenses for the building, taxes, insurance, repairs, all those things. So tell us how you put together the first deal. What was it and how did that happen? 
So uh, we 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 started searching in Tacoma for land, and we found we identified two uh, small infill sites in the down, downtown core area, and um, we we really just started uh, plugging in the numbers. Uh, we these sites happen to be. Um, I guess they were probably overlooked or they were passed over by other developers because they had challenges. Uh, their, their size being one, uh, they were, both of them were in the 2,500 to 3,000 square foot range. And um, they had different issues. One had a neighbor's fence on, on the property that we were gonna have to, uh, negotiate moving and not having some uncertainty about how that would work out with a neighbor involved. And uh, the second second property, I think it didn't have as favorable of zoning as the first property. It Tacoma has some districts that are designated for mixed use, and it's not that you can't build residential in in a commercial zone. It just has less incentives attached to it ta for taxes and how much parking is required. So um, yeah, I guess I'm talking about these two sites simultaneously because the first site is, the first site that we found uh, is where we, is the is where we're now, um, I'm standing in the building. <laughs> we, we finished that project last July and it, even though it was the first site we found, it was the second site that we developed. And we almost missed uh, buy the, the opportunity to buy this property at all, just because it was kind of in this weird uh, foreclosure position. It wasn't quite in foreclosure yet when we first found it, but then uh, it, was, it was going there, it was headed there. And... Uh, we knew that it could take a while or not even work out at all to, to get this property. So in the meantime, we had purchased the first one and we just happened to find out that this one uh, was still available and ended up closing the deal uh, almost at this, you know, in the same month as the first property. So we had these two, two sites lined up. So did you do anything interesting in terms of financing those properties or did you buy them outright? We paid cash for the land in in both of those, and uh, both sites were well under a hundred thousand dollars. So our nest egg that uh, I was mentioning from our Chicago renovation project was enough to cover most of that. Awesome. So now you have these. Well, first the other property and this property. You have the properties. How'd you go about getting the funding? Walk us through the project in the remaining time we have, and let's let us know. Was it was it a profitable venture? I mean, how how'd it turn out? Yeah, uh, well, it always feels like a strain when you're in the final months wrapping up a project. Uh, you know, you've gone through your contingency. You know, we spent a lot of time talking to banks and we gained the confidence of a bank and have worked with them on both projects now. And if I may interrupt, did you run these through as commercial loans or were they residential loans because they're for plexes? Um, they're technically, like they have a mortgage just like a, a regular home would have. Uh, so we, we were able to get a construction loan that automatically rolled into a mortgage, similar to, I guess, how you would do that for a residential property. Um, it, because there are technical differences, like on the first property, even though they're both four units, on the first property, we were able to have a residential appraisal. On the second mm -hmm. property, we had to have a commercial appraisal, costs a little bit more, but, um, but you know, we still, even though each property has its own LLC, we're, you know, we are the personal guarantor on, on the loan, like a residential loan would be. For both the properties? Yes, for both. Okay, so you're 
you 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 guaranteed the loans and so coming up with the down payments to get those how much cash did you have to put into the deals if you remember yeah it's 25 percent um and so it you know it ended up being um probably between a hundred and fifty to two hundred thousand roughly uh for each project and uh but that being said we as architects, we are able to get equity, uh, you know, through our drawings. We, you know, made an invoice uh, from our development company to our us, the architects, and and that does count, you know, towards that towards that equity, um, as well as the land costs and just kind of all the once we had paid for all of those uh, pre-construction expenses, permits, structural engineering, everything like that. Um, what we, The cash that we actually had to put in was probably closer to 50 to 75,000 uh, for mm -hmm. each project. And how did you come up with that money, if I may ask? Was that pulled out of operations from the business, from fee income, from a nest egg, grandma, grandpa? Yeah. All of the above. <laughs> We're scraping every corner, really. Uh, we did. We we did put a lot of our cash from our or, you know, our from operating the architecture side of the business. That uh, those earnings went in, as well as um, filling gaps with again family money, and in this case, uh, a little bit higher investments from family that we worked out a, a favorable interest rate, but you know, it's a little more, uh, official this time. Got it. Okay. So these, these projects, so you, you're able to get the construction loan, you would be able to begin building. What are your key takeaways from these two projects that you've completed? Well, it, it has been one takeaway that has surprised us, I guess that maybe we weren't expecting is that, it's really turned us on to continuing to work on this project type as a specialty, as a niche, uh, the missing middle housing. Uh, we just, you know, not only do we believe in it as a very uh, important component of neighborhoods for affordability and sustainability and just having vibrant neighborhoods to live in, uh, it's, it's helped us inspire i think other neighborhood developers people or people that don't think of themselves as developers uh to consider doing projects like this and really invest in their community oh, amazing and uh, do you have more of these did, did it turn out well enough that you're going to do more of these for yourself tell me about that i mean what was the end result here did you end up were they profitable for you or is it a long-term play walk us through that <laughs> it is a long-term play but uh for both projects, I would say within about a year to two years of the project being finished and stabilized, uh, we're feeling pretty good now. Uh, immediately after finishing a project is is a tough time financially. You know, you've sort of exhausted the reserves of your construction loan, but you still need to buy the appliances to get the apartments rented out, and so. There is you. There is a uh, an experience of just becoming comfortable with debt, but mm. uh, but then uh, after some time and having done it twice now, having gone through the process and seeing that you know it's not uh, it's not crazy to uh, pay it off, you know, over two years or something like that. So when you did the cash out loan, when you got the, the houses under mortgage, paid off the construction loan, at that time, were you able to pay back the investment? Were you able to take any money out at that time, pay back family members? How did that process work? Yeah, it worked a little differently uh, for the two projects. Um, so on the first project, we're, we're continuing to make uh, incremental payments to our investors. Um, so it... Uh, reduces a little bit the the cash flow of the building but uh, but it gives us more flexibility uh, to to use to not have to go without that uh, that money I guess to pay it all back at once 
Um, so it effectively is just making the mortgage a little bit higher for the time being. Uh, in the second case, we took out a home equity line of credit and paid off uh, most of our investor debt right away. Excellent. And then when you look at those two strategies, do you have a preference if you were to do it over again, which one do you prefer? It does feel a little bit better to uh, have your family paid back <laughs> right away. Uh, on the other hand, I think they're both good strategies. They're both working uh, for for us. And so what's next for you? Are you planning on doing more of these projects? Was it good enough that you want to do some more? Or are you basically looking to do more as, as architects where you're designing others or something we, else? We do want to continue developing. Uh, we uh, we hope that our next project will scale up a little bit, something in the 20 apartment range, perhaps. Now that we have some experience, we have some uh, capital, or, or I guess I just mean trust with, with banks and um, better relationships with subcontractors and all of that. Uh, so I would say, yes, we definitely want to continue as architect developers. And for now, we do want to continue developing the the architecture and side of our business as well. Uh, we do want to grow our client base. And um, we hope that uh, it, seems, it seems like this year things are different. Things are changing. Uh, the, our, we're getting out there more. I think one challenge, one opportunity cost of of the development projects is it's very consuming. And so you don't have time to go to networking events or really be doing the business marketing that uh, is good to be doing all year long. And so you miss out a little bit on, on that during a development project. So now that we've had some time to focus on that in 2019, uh, 2020 seems to be off to a good start. Brilliant. What advice, Katie, would you give to other architects, design professionals that want to get into the development game? Our advice is to uh, talk to us. <laughs> we are really happy to um, just have a phone call. We've done this a um, number of times with with architects and that are interested in how do I get started. We are very happy to to talk to you about that. We also recommend the Jonathan Siegel training. We definitely studied those uh, work workshops and uh, seminars and that was, we found that really helpful explaining performas and uh, how to include your architecture services in your equity to a project. And then we just say to have enough money. <laughs> Um, you know, probably at least 30% more than you think the project will cost. Uh, you know, it's, it's difficult to scrape that together, but it's better to do it on the front end than uh, catch up mm -hmm. at the end. And if someone's trying to scrape together money and they're, they're needing to bring in investors or other people to, to get, bring some money in, what would be a reasonable interest rate that someone could offer them and, and with confidence, assuming that obviously market conditions are different and there's no, there's no guarantees, but what would you say would be realistic if they're pitching an investor or a family member in terms of, Hey, here's, you know, give me this money now and there's going to be, we're going to go for this return on the back end for you. What, what would you, what would you say would be that, that figure? How would you approach that? Well, I think that with interest rates, uh, in banks being so low right now that when it's family, uh, you can negotiate something in the three to 5% range. You know, it's, that's lower than market rate, but uh, you know, your family might be willing to help you out with something like that. If it's a, if it's a, another type of investor, someone that you don't necessarily know, or even just someone who isn't your family and isn't really interested in your, in you personally succeeding um, and they're more interested in the, what the return is, uh, 
six to eight percent is is probably where you're where you're looking at. Brilliant. We've, well, yeah. Go ahead. We, we've heard of people using hard money as high as twelve percent, though. Yeah, and that works out for them. It did in their case. Yeah. Got it. Got it. Great. Well, Katie, thank you so much for coming on here. Now, if people want to reach out to you and get a hold of you and contact you, maybe have some questions, what's the best way to contact you, reach out to you? Yeah, uh, we have a contact form on our website, wc-studio.com, and you can reach me that way. Katie Chintas, thank you so much for joining us today on the Business of Architecture. Thanks a lot, Enoch. Have a good day. You too. And that is a wrap. As a podcast listener, I'd like to invite you to two free online educational seminars for firm owners. The first teaches you how to structure your firm to avoid the overwhelm and fires that plague so many firm owners. If you're ready to move from overwhelmed operator to excited owner, visit businessofarchitecture.com forward slash freedom webinar to access this free online training. The second seminar you can access shows you how to attract your ideal clients to your firm consistently day in and day out. Go to architectwebinar.com to access this training. The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host, and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract, bond, or commitment except to help you conquer the world. Carpe diem.